everyone, Sean Chandler here, and this is my spoiler-filled review of Ant-Man and the Wasp. If you're new to my channel, the way this kind of works is this is much more podcast style. I don't know how long this video is going to go, but much more freeform, giving my full thoughts, kind of expanding things. If you want like a slick, fast-moving production, I got my MCU rankings, I've got my regular movie review for this movie, but when I do my spoiler-filled reviews, it's intended to be a little bit more personal and spend a little bit more time marinating in my thoughts on things. So just so you know how this works, this one's going to go on for quite a while, and I don't even know how long it's going to go on for. With that in mind, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I don't want you to start with this video because I don't want to spoil it for you. So go and watch my other review for my general thoughts, and it's a good one, uh, at least from my perspective. Uh, I got to see the movie five days early before it came out here in the United States because I got to go, my friend invited me to a press screening and so then I had a few days to be able to kind of put some thoughts into it so I did this whole like intro on it uh, with some special effects which was a ton of fun and then I had a buddy of mine help me write some puns for it so I had a ton of fun, fun with that one um, and if you stick around to the end of this video I'm going to do some behind the scenes stuff for how I created my intro for the video so I can show you what it looked like before I did all my effects on it how silly the whole thing actually was so be sure to stick around to the end of this video also I recorded my day I did like a filmed a vlog of my day going to that press screening so if you want a day in the life type of stuff that's going to drop on my second channel in just a couple days. So with that in mind, I gave you plenty of prep warning. We're going to start diving into spoilers very soon. And um, with that in mind, I'm going to start talking about this movie. If you checked out my previous review, I really enjoyed uh, this movie. And it's not trying to be the best Marvel movie. It's not trying to be the biggest Marvel movie. It's just trying to be a lighthearted adventure. And I think it delivers on that. And, and I, having seen it a second time, this might be the most lighthearted movie in the entire MCU. Not necessarily the funniest, not necessarily any, there's other types of things, but just kind of lighthearted fun where you don't feel a weight on your shoulders as you're watching. Where like with Infinity War, you just feel like, oh no, is the universe gonna come to an end? This one was just kind of like this light, breezy, fun adventure with characters you like to be around um, trying to track something down. As I dive into this one, sometimes I just walk through the plot. With this particular spoiler review, what I'm going to do is just take all of my notes from my spoiler-free review and kind of go through them and dive into each of the specific things um, that I was thinking about as I said my um, spoiler-free version of it as opposed to walking through the plot because I'm a little bit under the weather at the moment and don't have the mental capacity to try and remember the entire plot lot of this movie. With that said, let's get started talking about the good. You have been warned. We're going to start diving into things. So as I said, my favorite thing about this movie is that it was just kind of lighthearted fun in that it's a movie all about everyone trying to get this, uh, the lab which, as you saw in the trailer, the lab shrinks down, and then we find out as we watch the movie. That's what the movie's about, is trying to get this lab, whether that is so Ghost can try and fix herself, or so that that's so Walton Goggins can try and sell it and make money. Everyone's trying to get it, but there's no kind of like, even our main villains, they're not like blowing people's heads off or anything like that. Ghost isn't allowed by Lawrence Fishburne to do anything particularly villainous. And so kind of the sense of like, there's not big, dire, fearful stakes where you're like, oh no, is someone gonna die? Uh, it's just like, let's have fun trying to get this thing as it gets getting tossed around like a game of tag uh, or something like that, as it just different people have it at different points in times and then we shuffle the story around. And, and I like that about the movie. And that's what also, the first movie was kind of a heist movie. What I said in my review is this was more of a MacGuffin movie. And so if you're not or familiar with the term MacGuffin, it's a term used for the a, a an item that's in a movie that the characters are trying to acquire that drives the plot forward. So probably the most famous MacGuffin movies of all time, or, so, or like some of the most famous MacGuffin movies of the last 40 years at least, would be the Indiana Jones movies. Each one of those movies has a very clear uh, MacGuffin, whether you're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, the Shankara Stones, the uh, Holy Grail, or the Crystal Skulls. Indiana Jones has a thing he's trying to get while Russians or it's in a Temple of Doom or the Nazis are trying to get it. That's what a MacGuffin is. And they make for good adventures because there's a thing that we're trying to get and you have chases and there's a little bit of a mystery and you have to do some research. And in that, this movie almost, it didn't, it doesn't in many sense, it doesn't 
in general feel like in Indiana Jones movies, but there's some similarities with chases and sitting around, where do we need to go next? And we interview someone, we've got a piece of information, now we need to go somewhere else. And there's a double cross in the mix. And that's, that's very Indiana Jones type stuff. And you feel that in this movie. And uh, I, I, that's like... And watching the movie, when I when it clicked, like, oh, Ghost isn't trying to kill everybody. Oh, Walton Goggins isn't going to take hostages and blow heads off or anything like that. This is just kind of this game of an item being passed between people. I was able to settle in and be more okay with the movie. And we'll talk about the villain issues in the film in just a little bit. But just on the type of story they were telling, perfect example of how the MCU has managed to have this tone uh, with the humor and the fun and the characters and the shared interactions and shared continuities and everything. But inside of this tone, they're going to tell all kinds of different stories. A heist movie, a political thriller with Winter Soldier, uh, this big intergalactic war with Infinity War. Or a MacGuffin movie about a lab that's been shrunk down to the size of luggage so it can be passed around from people to people. And um, yeah, that's just, it's a great that they're able to do that with this franchise. Also, the movie, one of the things the movie does well is that we have different uses of the Ant-Man technology and phasing and things like that. So the big obvious one is that we're getting a lot more of the quantum realm and giant man. Yeah, they're having a lot of fun with the suit going with, with the, you know, the new regulator that doesn't work quite right. So you get a bunch of fun elements kind of happening with the suit in that regard. And then, of course, as you get into the finale and he goes up to 85 feet and you see you know, him looking at the boat and everything like that. So you get the new elements in that sense. Ghost does the phasing thing, which works really nicely as a foe for superheroes that as they go to punch the supervillain, their hand goes through them. And so that was a nice little touch of um, with Ant-Man having the size shrinking and all ways that it, it they have physical punch type action going on. So how do you add a new element to that that's not like Yellow Jacket, which it's Ant-Man except evil. Or I guess it's more like it's Wasp except evil. So how do you create a new version of that? Well, the phasing thing seems like in the same category of someone that's a person that can kind of change the way they interact with the world around them. So that's an interesting different direction to go with it. So I thought that worked really nicely. And then we also go into this quantum realm a good bit more in this movie as one of the major plot lines is that we're trying to get um, the original Wasp Michelle Pfeiffer out of there. And so Michael Douglas gets sent into there. So we get kind of you dive into it even more to see what this realm and this world looks like. Uh, we don't get a lot of action, or they don't they don't do a lot with this. It's just kind of like a car trip in there, pick pick up and drive out. But we did get to see it a little bit. Next thing I talked about in my review was that they do the de aging in this movie like they did in the first one. This one starts off and has this kind of you know little adventure of the day that uh, old Ant Man and old Wasp departed and old wasp went subatomic shot down disappeared and so you get to see them de-aged and having seen the movie two times one time in 3d one time in regular one time you know a movie started and i wasn't really looking for it. it's like oh i guess they're doing de-aging right out of the bat again and second time i was watching it with the mindset of okay this movie starts out with de-aging i thought it looked phenomenal the first time but i had 3d glasses on the person behind me was talking so i was a little distracted let me just stare this thing down and see if I can spot any issues. Watching it a second time, it, it looked just as good. Like, I, I think they have crossed the uncanny valley. Um, and if you're not familiar with the term uncanny valley, it's 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 a weird phrase they've decided. To, just, I don't think it's a helpful term to describe things, but it's the phrase that they use when referring to computer-generated humans. And it seems like that's the final frontier of CGI where they can create Caesar the Ape and it's like, wow, this looks incredible. They can make water that's just uh, fantastic. But um, when it comes to humans, something always has looked off up until very recently. And even with the best of Star Wars technology in Rogue One, Tarkin, something about the face looked off. Something about Princess Leia and Rogue One looked just a little bit off. And even uh, Michael Douglas in the first Ant-Man was really close, but something in the mouth looked a little bit off. In this movie, I, nothing looked off to me. I, maybe you see something different, but to me, 
the, the, this is the one where whatever that gap is, that uncanny valley of the human perception and noticing what's all wrong and off in movies, I crossed over. It was, I, I mean, I believed it. I totally dug it. And then they did Lawrence Fishburne later in the movie. And once again, it was like, you guys are pulling this off. This technology is working. Um, and it's, it's weird to look at just being like, I, I know what this person looked like before. And wow, it just looks like them from back in the day with just a different style of haircut to match the world that you're creating here. This is this is incredible what you're doing here. Then we get a Stanley cameo in this one during kind of the final chase of it. And he's kind of staring there going into his car and then some of the shrinking stuff starts to happen around him. And so he's like, oh, 60s were fun, but I'm paying for it now. And I thought that was just like a great little Stanley one-liner zinger line in there. Also in these kind of a uh, uh, trademark MCU type things, we get two post credit scenes. One of them, pretty pointless. The one at the very end, I don't even know why they put it. It's like they felt obligated, like they had to have two. And so they put the second one in there. And I think the implication was that it's post Thanos snap because you can hear the emergency broadcast ringing that seemed to be what they showed on the TV. So everything in the world has gone post-apocalyptic and then it shows the ant still drumming which in and of itself just almost seems like gro <laughs> grossly crass and like what this is like a weirdly dark joke for a movie that doesn't have dark jokes in it um this is seems very ill advised to go in this particular direction with this post credit scenes. I, I thought that was weird what they did with that one. Not just, uh, I mean, it was kind of a little bit like, oh, that's kind of cute. And, but it's also, I don't, I don't dig what you're doing here. Now the other one, um, so Scott goes into the quantum realm and then Thanos snaps. Everyone that would kind of was there when he was sucked in is away. So he's stuck in the quantum realm. This was actually the only thing, this was the thing about this movie that was my prediction. I probably said it in a live stream too somewhere. At some point in time, I said this out loud, verbalized this, that my guess is that he's going to go quantum uh, in the post credit scene. I'm pretty sure I said that in some live stream at some point in time. And that's what happens. And um, so that wasn't really surprising. Like some people are like, oh, but wow. Even in my theater, people are like, oh, oh wow. It's like, what? Were you not expecting them to tie these two things together? Like, this seems like the obvious thing, direction that they would go to tie them together. So, I, I don't know. Maybe that's because I've just spent so much time in the world of the MCU that you start piecing things together and have I at least have a couple of good thoughts every single year. So, that happened. I, that's a good way to tie it together. That's a good use of the post credit scene to kind of bridge the movies and pieces of everything together. All right. Um, and then I want to talk about the cast for a little bit while we're still on the good... So first thing I talked about was Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly um, lead our film, and they just have some real nice chemistry between the two of them. And, and you, the there's the tension between them here seems to make more sense, and there's like a sweetness between them as well uh, that seems to be more believable in this film than in the previous one where there's enough time where there's two people that like each other and have a certain connection to each other, but at the same time, something happened that legitimately you can understand why they're they're frustrated and they're pulled apart and none of it really feels it doesn't feel manufactured it it's a very legitimate thing that it, like you believe that scott lang with kind of his personality as it's been portrayed in all of these movies captain america calls him up like hey i need your help with something he'd be like absolutely i can help you and you know we know the exact context of why he didn't say anything to hope or hank but that's what happened is he did, that he didn't. And you could believe that it was, oh, I got to get over there. I got to go help Cap. And so he went to go do that without thinking through the consequences and causes trouble for the people around him. And he feels deeply sorry about this. And that's where I think the move, what, what worked really well is that there's nothing about him that has any amount of like, oh, self-righteousness or like, oh, I had to do what I had to do. He's like, I'm, I'm just so sorry that what I did hurt you guys. Like, I never meant to cause this problem. I never, I just wanted to try and do the right thing. Someone asked for my help and I went to go help them in it and it ended up really badly for all of you. And that's, that's, it's, that's an interesting dynamic that, that they were able to weave together with these movies. 
And then in their relationship, as you see her now become wasps, so they're partners, and you get to see her as someone that clearly has been training a long time. And we'll talk about it once again a little bit. That there's not as much action in this movie as there probably should be, but especially watching it the second time, I mean, she's just tearing guys apart, clearly, like, you know, spin kicks and everything. Very well trained, where he's just like a guy that's like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in pretty good shape and can throw a punch, or <laughs> she knows all kinds of crazy move type stuff to do. So they work really well together. Speaking of the cast, one of the things that's always worked nicely with the MCU movies is that they get these big legacy actors, Michael Douglas, Lawrence Fishburne, Michelle Pfeiffer, in the case of this movie, to kind of fill out the cast and just bring this sense of respectability to that movie. And you see that here with Michael Douglas getting the opportunity to, to be the cranky old man that uh, because of the gravitas that he brings to the screen, like you believe that he's just this guy that's condescending towards everyone, can talk down to them and kind of get away with a lot of the sorts of thing um, as that's, he, he just can pull that off so well. And then how do you, how do you balance that? Who do you put there that can maybe balance an actor like Michael Douglas Morpheus. You put Morpheus on screen, and so you get just these two kind of guys with these big, long careers of respectability getting to spar off uh, against each other. Who's the person that can soften the cranky, mean, uh, sarcastic, condescending Hank Pym? Michelle Pfeiffer. And you just, they, they, they bring something to the film on just kind of this other level with these movies that works out nicely. And, and, um, uh, yeah, bring all sorts of nice dynamics to the film. And then this movie, we get more time with our group of ex-cons who now have a security company that Michael Pena is trying to run while it's probably going to go out of business soon. And that's what Paul Rudd's been doing. He's at his home working on that stuff for them while he's on house arrest. And... Uh, um, and so a little ice dynamic and they have these little scenes where they get to join in a little bit. And then, of course, just the, the, the classic Michael Pena element in these movies is, of course, the storytelling. So they came up with this great way. Like, how do we take that to the next level? How do we make it even crazier, weirder, stranger, indistinct and not just do what we did before? Truth serum. Sorry, truth serum doesn't exist. Something that makes him susceptible to... Uh, suggestion. So they give that to him. So it takes it just to that next level like, oh, that's a great idea to make this still fun. And then he gets to join in the action a little bit in the final chase scene where he's riding along with them in the different vehicles, then gets his own car. And so um, just finding a way to take those side characters, elevate their role a little bit at different times and continue the things that we loved about what we saw them doing before. And that's what this movie does well. All right, from there, we will move on to the mixed aspects of this film. And the big thing where I think this movie could have some interesting mixed perspectives from people is on the villain situation. So the movie doesn't really have a main antagonist or it doesn't really have a main villain. It has antagonists and you could ghost is the main antagonist, but ghost is not really a main villain by any sense of the imagination. When you've got someone that wants to destroy half the galaxy and people trying to commit genocide on planets in outer space, um, or doing all sorts of other villainous things and killing people in the scheme of things like someone that's dying and trying to get technology that's illegal technology from a person that has the Ill illegal technology that's not supposed to be doing like trying to, to use their technology to not die doesn't seem like the most villainous thing, especially when they're not allowed to kill anyone. And so she's also partnered up with Morpheus. And uh, once again, He's clearly not a villain. Like, he's very much not a villain. There's nothing he does that's particularly villainous. Even in the way the story plays out, um, Hank Pym goes to visit him and they ask for help. And he gives them the clues that leads them to Ghost. And, like, he had his reasons of wanting to get them over there. But he's not kidnapping people. He's not chloroforming them. He's not taking children, not killing people. He's just trying to help this girl that he's been trying to raise. And so she's not in pain anymore and being exploited by S.H.I.E.L.D. So all of that makes for very interesting and kind of complex motivations with the characters as opposed to um, selfish and evil, which is you know kind of the motivation of the Walton Goggins character. But it, it creates a scenario where our only character in his is that's really villainous is Walton Goggins, but even he's not designed to be kidnapping people, blowing heads off. He's just like an arms dealer that wants some technology and so is trying to exploit people. But 
like they don't ever have him go to any particularly evil level, which works nicely in the movie to keep keep it light and make it a movie that, you know, my kids can watch. And I don't have to worry about it. Be like, eh, maybe don't watch this part of the movie or anything like that. Um, but you don't really have any strong villains here. You just have conflict and tension and competing values as they all want this lab. They're all trying to get it. So that creates the conflict as the, it's getting tossed around, playing a little bit of a game and keep away from each other. But there's not a main villain. And I can see where a lot of people would be like, oh, man, this movie doesn't work because there's no villain. This movie has a serious villain problem. I just don't know. I don't I don't know if that's a villain problem because the story just doesn't, by the nature of it, doesn't need to have someone blowing heads off and trying to blow up a city. The reason that you say that you know Yellow Jacket was a weak villain because he was designed to be kind of a super villain that wanted an evil suit to do evil things. And so he's presented as a super villain. Walton Goggins isn't presented as a supervillain. Ghost isn't really presented as a supervillain. So if you take them on face value, it's just a movie about people trying to get a thing before the other person gets to the thing. So I'm not sure. Sure. Other kind of mixed one on here is Michelle Pfeiffer. Great that she's in the movie. Does a great job in the movie. Just has like such a motherly, motherly vibe to her, the way she's portrayed in her little bit of time in the movie. And that's the problem. She's only in the movie a little bit. And I don't know if that's because the setup is that she's going to be a major part of Ant-Man 3 or down the line. We're going to get a ton of her. But if they don't have another movie that she's in, it seems really weird that she'd be like, we got Michelle Pfeiffer for two minutes of screen time or whatever it was. I mean, um, I mean it's under 10 minutes because you got the intro. And then, you know, she starts to appear in the last 15-ish minutes of the movie, but she's not in all the 15 minutes of the movie because she's only in the quantum section of it. And so then... Five minutes of screen time, a very, very little screen time. The movie's all about her because they're trying to get her, whether you're talking about ghost or trying to rescue her, but such a small part. So that, that was interesting uh, to get someone like her that you just, it, it's so present in the mind of anyone old enough to know who Michelle Pfeiffer is to be like, why isn't she in the movie more? Why did, couldn't you give her more to do? And other than, you know, even if you, they give her powers in the end, but all she does is go on someone's head to fix them. So... See, I, I, like that's not a negative, but it's it's an underused positive. Maybe that's a way to phrase it. From there, let's move on to the bad. The first thing that comes to mind is this movie is very light on action. And not only is it light on action, all of the action is in the trailer. Uh, I remember seeing the trailer, and I think even in maybe my last trailer reaction I did for it, saying something along the lines of like, oh yeah, I'm sure there's good, like they're only showing us the first two thirds of the movie, and then there's going to be a big twist, and we're going to find out who Ghost really is, and see a bunch of crazy fun stuff as we go into the third act of the movie, because it feels like they're not showing us a whole bunch of the movie. And that's not really what happened. What happened was they showed us all the action, and they didn't give us much of the plot of how the elements fit together. But... Um, I mean, think about the action sequences in the movie. You've got the wasp one. Um, I mean, I mean are, you've got the wasp one at the beginning with Walton Goggins and his guys. And then, you know, there's a lot of transferring back and forth to places. But then is it just the heist at the or the car chase at the end that goes on for a while? Like, there's so little, so few action sequences in the movie uh, that it's like, even as I'm thinking, I'm like, there's even fewer than I thought. And there was a few when I watched it the first time, and then the second time I was like, wow, there's really not much action in this. And then thinking about it now, it's like, there's just no action in this movie. And they, sh like, they really, all of the cool shots in the movie where you'd be like, oh, that was cool. They're all in the trailers. Whether you're talking about the gigantic man reveal at the end of it, you're talking about where he's not gigantic, but pretty big man that's you know using the, the truck as a um, as a scooter. Um, that's in there. Wasp beating people up in the vehicles. Michael Pena driving the car as the like rocks are falling all around it. Wasp throwing things out the back and like the Pez dispenser. Like all of the salt shaker in the, the kitchen at the beginning fight. All of it's in the trailers. Like all of the cool things are in the trailers and that's that's not good. That's, you, they needed to have more more of that stuff in the movie. And then like the giant man stuff in the movie, we, we get him getting big quite a bit in the movie, but a lot of it's just kind of played for laughs. Whether you're talking about the school sequence where he suddenly you know, gets gigantic in the school or, you know, filling up the suit gigantic while it's hollow and empty, so it's like a balloon. Um, or even the boat sequence stuff is just, he stands up and then, you know, flicks the guy a little bit and pushes him over. 
but they don't they don't like they didn't come up with anything that was a rival to Giant Man. There wasn't anything for him to like do as Giant Man to be you know, punching it or anything, whatever that would look like. And so then it just turns into a joke mechanism. And even some of the stuff that they used with him, um, it's only because the regulator's broken. It's not like he's like, the best way for me to be able to do this is to get gigantic. No, it's just his suit wasn't working, so he just happened to be gigantic. Not that he wanted to be gigantic. And that seems like an odd direction to go to not have our character using his superpowers intentionally to do things, but like by default, like, oh, I guess I got to do it this way. Uh, seems a little bit odd to me. And really, the probably the biggest issue that I had with um, the movie, both times I watched it, was that the the plot lines with Ghost and the Pym family, I, I just don't understand exactly why they did it the way they did it. Um, whereas it's so com miscommunication driven or not even miscommunication, illogical communication because they have shared values. Like we want to get her out so that we can save her or so that we can use her. But the key thing is all of us agree we want to get her out. And we know there's other people involved in all of this that are trying to 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 take this. So why you the logical thing, let's work together. You've still got a little bit of time, Ghost, and so let's put all of our big brains together, try and see what we can come up with. And we're pulling someone out of the quantum realm, who knows, that has this energy related to her. Um, let's just see what that looks like before we just, we assume what the best thing is to do. Like there's not, there's not really any logic to the idea of why they're in competition the way they're in competition. Even if you factor in Ghost is emotionally compromised and desperate. Even in that context, you just say to her, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. We've got three, br four brilliant minds. Once we get her, uh, uh, pull her at Janet out. We got four brilliant minds and we don't know what she's even gonna be like. So before you go cuckoo and start offing people and causing trouble, let's just see what we can do with this. There's no reason to pull her apart prematurely. And so that's just the way the story elements fit together where there was in conflict, it just seemed to be so that they could have kind of the cat and mouse, um, the, the game of uh, keep away with the item and tossing it back and forth between the different factions. It was just the screenplay had to do that for the story to move forward, and that's the only reason it worked out that way. And um, I, I don't think it was by any means the most logical explanation for why all of those different things were happening. And just a few more kind of negatives on this one. I felt like they established some themes in the first half of the movie about Hank's ego. Like that's very heavily set up in um, the fallout with different people, Lawrence Fishburne, of course. And then it kind of turns into they double this with Ghost and her dad was run off by Hank and uh, his pride and ego fired. And that's what led to um, that happening. So that really kind of led to the creation of Ghost. So they're like cre creating this scenario where there's all of these different people that have paid the price of Hank's ego. But that it's not like that's a theme that has a big resolution at the end or that has a payoff or that it, they take somewhere. It's just like they put this idea out there of like, Hank's ego. And then a, <laughs> then we reference it a little bit in the last few minutes, but it doesn't, it's like an abandoned theme that was so heavily kind of put out there, repeated, and then forgotten about. That was weird to me. And then, um, the Deuce Esk Machina conclusion, I always mispronounce that one. I need to I need to hear someone say it properly, and just uh, 10 times or something, and let it so absorb it in my brain. But the Deuce Esk Machina conclusion, that's a phrase, if you're unfamiliar with the phrase, that refers to when in a movie that to resolve the plot line, a new element is introduced at the last minute that just kind of resolves everything. As opposed to the choices that our characters make throughout the film leading up to being able to resolve the problems, or um, uh, what they've been working towards, they accomplish a goal, they make a choice that they need to make. It's just some new thing, it's just kind of introduced at the end that resolves everything, like, we're okay! And that's what this movie does, which is to say everything's been about, like, we got Ghost has to get uh, Janet out to pull out all of her quantum energy out of her, and they're gonna pull her to pieces, and like, can we do this, should we do this? Hmm, I don't know, but Ghost's in big trouble, and that's what's driving her to do all the things that she's doing. Then all of our other team, they just want to save her and her to not die. We get to the end of the movie, 
She comes out, goes like freaking out, gonna die, and she Jan walks up, puts hands on her. I hope I'm saying the right name. But now I'm thinking maybe getting nervous. Maybe that's not the right name, but puts her hands on her, and she can just transfer energy, no problem. And it's just like, oh, you got a superpower. So they just do sex monitor. And she gains the power of battery or quantum energy transfer to solve phasing ghost person pain. Just, just happen to have the perfect superpower to be able to take away this person's pain and has the ability to transfer it through her fingers and ghost's head is able to just absorb this energy. That's not an earned conclusion. That's not our characters made choices and sacrifices and they changed or the ingenuity. It's just, all right, um, she just happens to be able to fix the problem. That's not good. Uh, final thing, I saw it in 3D. No reason to see it in 3D. I saw it, seen it two times. First time was IMAX 3D, so even good 3D. And the regular, there wasn't anything particular about the 3D that... Um, impressed me at all and I can the novelty of 3D 3D can sometimes be fun for me this one was just like okay that's whatever <laughs> uh, I've got glasses on watching this movie and it looks funky so nothing exciting about that let's see what else is there anything I forgot to talk about um I dug the way that this movie ties into the greater MCU which is to say that it's a direct sequel to Civil War which has been interesting the way they've kind of done that, where Black Panther is a direct sequel to Civil War. Now, this movie is a direct sequel to Civil War. Infinity War is, is a direct sequel to Civil War in many in certain ways. And just that that's the, what makes this universe so fun to me, is that you do an event in a movie like that, and it trickles out into the other films and really does change the interaction of the characters and what happens in their films. And that happened in a Captain America movie, and it so determined what happened in this movie. And uh, that's some of the cool stuff about the MCU to me that makes this is a special thing that no one else has figured out how to do this type of storytelling and um, kind of taking certain elements of serialized television and putting it in movie form. They've pulled it off. They've done something no one else has done. And that's why I love it. I, I just all the gimmickry of all of it. Love, love, love it. And uh, so the, even the setup of this movie, I, I really dug it. So overall, a movie that's not like, you know, one of my favorites, but it feels like one that would be real easy to rewatch. Just a, a fun movie that doesn't, doesn't weigh you down, doesn't exhaust you, doesn't take anything out of you, puts a smile on your face. It has like a romantic, like that romantic mind, which is just like a, I think that some of the interviews they said it was trying to be like a rom-com. It's not really like that, but it's all about very kind of sweet and genuine relationships. What are you talking about Scott with his daughter, um, Hank, and, you know, having just a soft side to him. Uh, uh, mothers, daughters, and then, of course, of course, Scott and Hope and their relationship with each other. And, you know, Evangeline Lilly coming off a lot more, you know, just smiley in this movie and less angry. And it just makes for a movie that puts a smile on your face. It's just easy to digest, easy to consume cinema. That's what this movie was for me. Anyway, there you have it. There is my spoiler review of this movie. But like I told you at the beginning of this, I got a nice treat for you guys that I'm going to put some behind the scenes footage of the what it looked like as I was shooting my intro to um, my spoiler free review of this movie. So uh, be sure to put your thoughts down below. Tell me all those spoilers or comments, all that can be jam packed with it, of course. So don't feel the need to say spoiler or anything like that. Just feel free to say whatever you want. With that said, um, talk to you later. Check out my behind the scenes stuff. Well, this is awkward. Well, this is awkward. Well, this is awkward. No, no, no.